it affects us, but only like the farms and bungalows right on the edge of the coast. So you don't really think about it until it happens to you. We were used to living by the cliff. We are used to seeing that happen. And we just, no, it's just part of the, the landscape, part of life up here. I never even think about it, really. The people have grown up with it, people know it's there and that's it. This is a mud ball. Mud balls mean erosion, active erosion at that locality. Holderness is being consumed by the sea at one of the fastest rates in Europe. I, I devote my time to, most of my time to try to understand the causes and processes of coastal erosion here and to try to capture them in pictures. I've always been interested in coastal erosion here on um, East Yorkshire. As soon as I was old enough to drive a car I used to come here to the coast on summer evenings for instance and wondered about this, uh, what was happening here and I'd perhaps come a couple of years later to the same place, same location and a bit more was missing and this really intrigued me. What started off as a fairly casual, you know, just have a look at this and has become rather a, a full-time job. Coastal erosion here in Holderness is essentially the sea regaining its own rightful territory. The cliffs you see here, soft cliffs, are made up of clay and sand and small stones, and sometimes larger stones, left behind by glaciers on the last ice age. Ah, the ice melted and the, the, the material within the ice simply was deposited and here it is. It's soft, it's unconsolidated, it washes away quite easily when the tide is lashing against the, the, the base here. Ah, and um, it's been going on for thousands of years, it's nothing new ah, and it will continue until the sea finds its original coastline some miles to the west of here. I went to sea when I was 12. I went to Iceland, pleasuring with my Uncle Gil. My Uncle Gil was a trawler skipper out of all. I went when I was 12, 13 and 14. And when I left school, I went to see Silver Kingston's. I did five trips, deep sea, that's all, and I'd had enough of that. Then I ended up at Drax Power Station. When I finished there, that was back in 1983. And I had a little boat, messing about off the beach. And we started fishing off the beach. That was in 83 and I made a living at it so I went full town and I, I, I did nothing else till I retired 30 years. I was fishing from Ornsey and we started off in a little 16 foot pebble and then progressed to a cobble and then we ended up with a, a catamaran. Well, when I first started at Own Sea, I mean, when I first started, I had 100 and, 100, about 120 pots, but we used to go netting as well for Dover soles, and you could make a living on Dover's in the summer. And we used to work between the two, so I made a living. And then we progressed where, well, I only used to work 600 pots, but some of the lads down there now working like, 1600 pots. It's completely changed, well, everything. You know, like lobsters, like basically spring here was our crab, crabbing season, 
and then you then you progressed into lobsters and October you had all your gear out and you'd go netting in the winter you know for cod now you just, you just go potting all year round because you can't make a living on Dover soles you can't make a living on cod it's doing but like lobsters where's the lobsters come from we never got lobsters like they do now you know it's you know I mean like me like 100 kilo days was the norm you know not now 200, 200, 300 kilos, some of them. But in, during the 1970s, they decided to seed them. And so they got millions of little quarter inch lobsters and popped them into the sea. And they've never looked back since. It's just been full of lobsters because lobsters are good, good money. It's so good, is the floral home. The children love it. The old age codgers like us love it. And the, the teenagers love it. It's just, everybody that comes here, come here because they like it. Structurally, it's quite good. It needs one or two things doing, and renovating, but uh, things don't last forever. I mean, it's, it was 100 years old in June, I think, this year, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, but it's still in good order. It's, it's, it's just marvelous. like as if you were living 40, 50 years ago when it was really. Yeah. And it's everybody, really nice. it, it's full in there, and everybody yeah. joins in and sings, and we have a. It's, it's just uh, good old fashioned, and it's like going back to your youth, <laughs> if you can remember that far. <laughs> There's some photographs on a the wall there showing you what it was like on here when the trains first came. Oh, yeah. And that yeah. beach was mm. absolutely packed. Packed solid. Oh, yeah. mm. There were even donkeys on it, weren't there, before they had these uh, rocks, you see. Yeah. They put all these rocks down for coastal erosion. You know, after that village at Burton went went into the sea. And they used to have the uh, the little huts on wheels, yeah. and they used to get yes, chains in the huts, and and then they used to get them down nearer to the sea and open the doors, and then they went into the sea, mm. virtually fully dressed. I was a bit in the, in the, in the, Half of Hull used to come up on the on the, on the train from Hull and get through uh, through Withensea and up to here, yeah. and uh, and. It, I've seen, I've seen films of the people getting off the train yeah, and, and all coming onto the yes, beach here. The and it yeah, was the biggest big thing. When, when they shut that railway station, the, the, the population yes. for holiday purposes, it, it, it dropped. Slumped. Slumped yeah, terribly. Yeah. And Hornsea has always been um, threatened by the sea, I would suppose. I mean, back in time, we've lost villages into the sea, lost Hornsea Burton. Um, and even if you go back to postcards in the early 1900s, where it's actually gouged out by, by an, a great storm, and it's all just mud, it's just like clay. And so, Obviously, the time came to build proper defences. The shoreline management plan looks at how the coastal um, process takes place and what needs to be done to ensure that um, Lincolnshire doesn't disappear underwater. Uh, that's my take on it. They'll probably tell you something different. But effectively, we need to maintain the longshore drift down the coast. And there are selected settlements such as Hornsea which will be protected from the sea. With all the different government groups and uh, yeah. these are the people who are saying leave it be and let nature take its course uh, except for your protected areas. Uh, the communities, uh, they, they understand it because their houses have lost their value and in fact are falling into the sea. But that's what the people on the coast are, that they are <coughs> living on the edge, literally. And you don't know how much of the coast is going to go at any one point, because it, it doesn't sort of go an inch at a time. So you've, you've got the contradictory nature, if you like. You've, you've got the sea as a threat, as a, as a foe. You've also got the sea 
as a friend, as something which encourages people to come to boost the local economy, people to go out to fish. A cobble is a boat which has developed over the last thousand years uh, along the Yorkshire coast from the Scottish border down to Spain and it's held the whole the whole county together as far as fishing goes over that period. Uh, it's a boat which was developed for launching off the beach. It had to be light enough to be pushed down the beach so three men would push a 26 foot boat down down the beach and it had to be sailed. They were just built with larch, larch planks, big wide wood planks, riveted together and then uh, and then ribbed out with natural bends of oak. You just got an oak tree, cut all the bends out whereabouts you wanted them and they're just fastened together. Usually three men to a boat, two men and a boy to a boat. If you had any more it was another share the, the catch got shared by another one, so they took a, the least men possible to, for, uh, for the cobbles. I can remember quite a lot of the stories they told. They were very, very superstitious family. Um, for instance, on land, my mother would always say to me, don't sew a button on wearing a garment because you're sewing sorrow on your back or on someone else's. If you had a tumbler and you clashed it with another and it rang she was to say you're whipping up a storm at sea these were you know the things i was brought up with and i firmly believed i think you'll find in among the fishing families they still continue um i don't know how much of it is general superstition or how much of it was peculiar to the fisher folk but um they were a very very superstitious group of people i, I think they they lived by the sweat of the brow, really. Um, and I think the chancy nature of, of the dangerous occupation that they went out to sea, never knowing if they would be coming back, perhaps engendered that superstition in them. It was a hard life, and they were quite childish when they came back from sea, especially if they'd had a good catch. Um, it was usually straight to the pub. The wives would be waiting at home with the children and if they were lucky there was some money left when the men came home. If they'd had a good catch the wives would be treated to new clothes and the children would be treated to a dog and um, they would you know spread it around because that might be the last time they would see their family. So they were living on the edge of that all the time so emotions were quite heightened I think. There was a concrete road going left and bungalows out the side of that. And there was That's a camp a campsite up there. But you know, people there was a chap he had a campsite and he, he had tents in his pair, you know, in his area. I was born in nineteen forty seven and uh, my my mother and father the father was just come back from the war, obviously, my mother and then I was born. And uh, he decided he'd like to have a place at Albury, so he got a bell tent behind the pub. And there was also, around the, the, the caravan field, around the Royal Hotel, uh, railway carriages and wood nuts and that sort of thing, you know. And uh, one was called the Lion Cage. It was supposed to belong to some circus company of. But, uh, it was it was a beautiful place to be, and, and I I always used to go, me and my brother for for six weeks holiday every year. As soon as the school holidays came, we was off to Albury. There was a lifeboat station. The space after that, between there and the cliff top, was once used for fairground rides. 
it, it well, it wasn't really big, but he had room for a waltzer and a couple of swings and stuff like that that got put on in in this in this summertime. And a large number of people used to come on weekends or and 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 on bus from from Hull and come and spend the, the day at Albury. There was steel steps down at one time, and uh, obviously people went down on the beach from there. And the people who had the the cafe would take uh, trays f f of tea and sandwiches down from. It was amazing how many how people lived in these wooden nuts on the cliffs. So, uh, I think possibly some of them uh, because of the bombing and all went to live in in wooden nuts. But uh, it was a fair sized community really, and and fishing was the big thing for for a lot of people. There was quite a few people had boats and things, you know. And you could put your boat, fasten the boat on the, at the top of the cliff and lower it down on this cable and it'd land on the, they had some sort of something anchored in the beach for it to fasten so and when you came back with your boat there was a there was an A35 engine in in this thing and it would lift the boat up that was just made by, by the men who, who, worked, who lived who holidayed there, you know what I mean? Yes. Peter, tell everybody. He's been in a fight and he's blind. And that's Peter. Hello. He's been on the telly. And he comes and goes for a walk with us. Follows us, follows us right around the cliff top. He does. I came to this country 55 years ago from Germany and I've been lived on the coast. Oh part of my married life and uh, ten years ago we got married that one there and it's been a very happy liaison so but we had the problem of cliff erosion cliffs went our homes went but I felt I got to stick it out I'm not gonna move because where there's enough land between us and the sea. Now it's not going to be pushed out. And to go and live in a city, if I get it. You see a sunrise here, there's nothing finer. Oh, and this is the joys you have at the seaside. Change of weather, from sublime to the ridiculous, sunshine to storm. Otherwise it's fine. You can actually feel the vibrations. And that's nothing new though. 27 years ago we could feel the vibrations of the tide and we can still feel it now. They can in the pub and that's a solid brick building and it, as it hits the cliff, thud, you can hear it, you know, and everything kind of, not violently shakes, but ever so slightly moves, you know. First time it did it when I were in bed not long after we first came here, I, didn't, I just didn't know what it was, it never entered my head. I thought, what, the bed actually shook, you know. In, in years and years to come, there'll be no no there'll be none of this because the erosion is quite drastic at times. But then for years it never moves, mm. so it's the hand of in the hands of the gods. Mm. Houses have gone, uh, pubs have gone, coast guards have gone, has gone, uh, bingo halls have gone, cafe have gone, all gone over the years. Little. But a wooden bungalows all scattered along the cliff tops, right up to oh way past town. But they've all gone, sadly gone. There's no community up here anymore. It's only about half a dozen houses in there. The rest have, have vanished. So we have we're do you know what we're called? We're called the cliff dwellers. No, <laughs> we live a life of our own here. We live in our own little hamlets quite nicely. They had all sorts of ideas what to do. Tires, blocks. It's all too expensive and it would be quite a, a, an area to be done. And the news was that uh, Arbor and Clifftop has to go to the sea. So it's left to the elements to slide away. Mm -hmm. No one's fault. 
it's in the, the hands of the elements. What I'd really like to happen is what I've been fighting for for 27 years now is coastal protection. Yeah. Mappleton, have you been to Mappleton, the next village up? You'll see that's all been done. Mm -hmm. That. The reason for that is because it's the main bus route and it was cheaper to do the coastal protection than reroute the road. You see? That's why they've got it, not the properties, it's to save rerouting the road. And all the experts say that since it was done, it is not coming in any quicker here. But as for one who lives here, and they all agree with me, it is coming in much quicker since it did Mappleton. It makes me angry, very angry. But to be fair, <coughs> when we bought it, my solicitor checked with the local council, which wasn't this one, it was holding us borough council then. They did, we did check and we were told we had 40 to 60 years before the house would have to be demolished. Well, we worked it out and we thought we should be well gone in that time. But of course now we've got about six to eight left. So it's debatable whether we should still be here or not. Yeah, so I don't know, we just haven't got a future here. That's it. As I say, there's a good likelihood we shan't be here when it happens. It's 50 50 either way, which, take it from me, is a horrible position to be in. It's terrible. You don't want to lose your home. You don't want to die. <laughs> which comes first. Yeah. We're looking after our ram, we're not like wind, so you get it all paid for. <laughs> if you get a big smell coming in and your tractor doesn't start or something like that. And nobody else can help us here, like. Nobody, nobody, else, can help nobody us. else is here to help and you just we're on our own, like. On your own. <laughs> and on a winter time down here it's awful. It's <laughs> nice now it's warm, but when it's cold and raining and snowing, it's awful. If we get northwesterly winds, it takes all the clip away. Every year we're losing it and losing it, every year we're losing it. We're moving it this year, the compost. Mm -hmm. When I first come here, there used to be a lifeboat station on there. It's gone. <laughs> nice. You can lose up to about three metres a year over a season. I want to get after gear in now, you see, because I reckon it's going to come bad this winter. You don't leave all your gear out in the winter, you bring most of it back, half of it back in, like. But like tomorrow, that's what we'll be doing, bringing more pots in, like tomorrow. See, we'll get another six of them in, six fleets of them. Six fleets of 20 tomorrow. I'm excited going out with him when I was about 11. Like, in some old days, when I was at school, when it was nice weather. Yeah, I liked it. And now I'm doing it with him. It's not very nice in winter, though. came and lived in Easington about 1940 so I've lived virtually with the coast and the river for what 74 years I worked on farms well I started with my grandfather because he was a farm worker and then when I left school I went on farms and a lot of our land from the farm I worked at was up the cliff well nearly all of it was in a sense and uh, we lost a lot of land I mean I once had a plough when I went back after about a month or so it was about 10, 15, 20 foot down I had to get chains and pull it back up and your combine would rock as you went because it, it cracked it doesn't drop suddenly it isn't like shale cliffs where they suddenly drop down and uh, it, it has, it's changed quite a bit but army have been there since I don't know when but during the first world war they installed some 9.2 guns both there in Kilnesey uh, which were removed later on and there were smaller ones during the war. There was minefields along the cliff edge but when you got to sort of the south of Easington it was sandy, it was what we used to call bents and it was sand with all 
the old sea types of grasses in it and, uh, and that and that uh, a lot of that got washed away in 53 of the big floods you know east coast floods we oh we'd gone to Withensea hadn't we to the pictures mm. and when we came out of the pictures at Withensea it the water was flooding all the main, the main street so we got on the on the coach came back to Easendon and the village was flooded <laughs> the village was flooded yeah. and there was police there was the Royal Air Force lads and lorries and people lorries with blankets and goodness knows what all sorts of things and it was crowded and they said and I lived at Kilsey at the time it was before we were married actually and they said no no you can't you can't go to Kilsey it's completely flooded all the way down so I stopped at Henry's house that night and we went in the morning didn't we have a look round and it was just <laughs> because the wind and the uh, the wind and the high tide coincided a lot of people used to come in those days after the war when people got cars and there wasn't package holidays they'd come and there'd be maybe 100 cars at seaside and you could go to Tommy Ducks and buy a jug of tea and take your mugs and that down onto beach and then come back with them and they just trusted people to uh, bring them everything back. And, yeah. It used to be like just a wooden shed with a flap that lifted, lifted up. up yeah. That's all. Dad used to have to carry the water from home down to the hill because there wasn't any water. People used to always cut the hedges and if you had a big hedge and you cut it by hand, you didn't have mechanical cutters, then you loaded the thorns on a trailer and took them to where you wanted them. But if the farmers didn't want them, they took them down south of Easington and then put them in like groin, stake them in, and then the sand built up. My uncle Kenny was rather a, a character. He, uh, his idea was to stake old cars that were scrapped, put them out, stake them down, sand build up, and uh, that never materialised. It will become an island, I would think, and the, the end will build up. It, it's always come and gone over the uh, centuries of span. And, uh... So, stood on the end of the boulder clay is the last fixed area of the Holderness Coast. So we now come on to the very dynamic sand spit. Spurn is clearly about movement, movement of sand. In October, the peninsula moved 30 metres. That's incredible to think of a, a piece of land, albeit sand, that it has that dramatic movement. Um, without the erosion of the boulder clay, the brown backdrop that is behind me, um, Spurn would not be here. It is formed by that material being washed down from the north and forming this sand spit over the boulder clays of Holderness. It is not about birds against people. There is a whole system involved. You know, the impact of defending a small location could be significant enough to have Spurn start to disappear and that affects the estuary. And the estuary supplies 16% of UK's gross products goes up the Humber. So the loss of the Humber estuary or the deep water channel could affect our lifestyles. The wind farm which has been developed off the coast is at approximately the distance where the coastline would have been when the Romans arrived in Britain. So we're looking at our history books, what's that, um, 2,000 years ago, something like that, I don't know, a bit less, and your coastline was there. It has continued to erode since that time. You come in closer and you get concrete on the beach. That is a snapshot in history which is a remnant from two world wars. The process is ongoing. We as human beings, and residents have settled in one place and we settle there in by the very term of that word is we want to stay there we enjoy what we're looking at we want 
to see that view, we want to enjoy our sense of place. But the coastline doesn't stop when we settle, it carries on moving. And the Romans, if they had to come back today, would not recognise the place where we stand. Thank you.